Okay, so once again, in this presentation, we're going to be looking at electronics thermal management uh, with flow simulation. So basically, the various ways we can cool off our electronics, keep them at a correct temperature, um, using our CFD tool flow simulation, which is also a really great tool for thermal analysis. So why are we talking about this topic today? Well, I think it's especially relevant because the power density of electronics is still increasing, and it's um, leading to more innovative solutions being necessary for cooling. So the example we're going to walk through today is a, is a rack-mounted server, uh, a 1U rack-mount server, which is one of the more power-dense uh, formats. And uh, you know, these data centers of servers um, are coming up with some interesting cooling solutions. Like it used to be just all air cooling, dumping that heat out into the room and then removing it with air conditioning. Well, now a lot of them are moving to liquid cooling. So they're actually cooling the most power generating uh, components on the, on the server with, uh, say, like a liquid or, or water coolant, something like that, and uh, pumping that heat right out of the building so they can run those liquid lines up to a radiator on the roof and that's a lot more efficient than you know dumping the heat into a conditioned space for it to be removed by AC. So that's one example, but um, in this webinar we're going to cover both how to set up air cooling, how to set up an analysis on you know heat sinks and fans, and also how to set up a liquid cooling loop and look at uh, some of the setup involved uh, and kind of tricks and tips involved in those things. So this is a little bit more advanced of a webinar. It's a little different than what we typically do. Um, but I wanted to kind of cover these tips. At least this year alone, I've, I've dealt with more than a few customers uh, working on liquid cooling applications. So I thought it was relevant to include there. So what is flow simulation, though? Let's talk about that for a second. So it's a CFD tool. It's a general purpose fluid dynamics tool. Um, we can do things like supersonic flow. We can do aerodynamic problems. We can do a lot of different things. We can do um, even HVAC type problems with the right uh, modules for flow simulation and many different categories but what we're going to be focusing on today is the electronics cooling applications so kind of our agenda here for what we're going to walk through uh, we want to talk about the considerations for how we'd set up a flow simulation study for you know an air cooled system and then we'll look at basically designing like the radiators and the, and the water blocks for a cool a liquid cooling system and actually implementing that and looking at that overall system's performance. We'll also look at the electronics cooling module, which is an optional add-on for flow simulation, and that just enables a lot of like nice productivity tools and some enhanced capabilities. So we'll look at all that. But if you were expecting, for some reason, a more introductory level webinar, there's some uh, archived webinars on our website there, hawkridgesys.com slash videos. That's the same place you'll be able to view this webinar after it's been recorded and uploaded. And it's, again, going to be a little different because I want to talk a little bit about my process as I work through uh, putting together this model and, and running these simulations. So uh, I'm just going to put in the relevant tips and tricks that I ran into through this process, kind of setting up a, 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 an assembly level analysis and flow simulation here. So as our kind of baseline, I want to use this example, which is a traditional rack mount server. Uh, it's got dual CPUs and you're relying on just air cooling, just a bunch of fans in there to keep this thing cool. And I'm going to take a look at how I set that up in flow simulation. Now again, this isn't going to be like a uh, complete tutorial, but we're going to look at some of the most interesting features and um, some of the most interesting setup. So in just a moment here, we'll switch over there. So here I have this study open inside SOLIDWORKS, uh, and I have the flow simulation study created. So I want to do this a little bit backwards. I want to show you the end results <clears throat> and talk about them, and then we'll work back through the, the major setup steps that happened. Um, so here I have the study created. There's quite a bit of definitions that need to happen on a thermal analysis. So we want to define the appropriate material models, like copper and for the heat sinks, aluminum, the silicon for the chips. Um, and all the different heat sources. So we have that all defined here, and then as a result, I'm able to load up my uh, flow results from the study, and I'm able to see resulting temperatures, 
and patterns in the airflow so I can identify if there's any bottlenecks anywhere, if I could have better fan placement somewhere else. Okay. So load up these results here. And there's quite a few different ways we can interpret the results. We can do cut plots. So I can look here at a, at a plot of velocity, uh, kind of with some, I have some streamlines overlaid on here so we can visually see the pattern and the flow in between here. It takes a lot of um, velocity and pressure to push the airflow through these kind of banks of heat sinks here. Again, dual CPUs, lots of RAM chips, things like that. Um, so we have that airflow pattern there. I can look at the actual temperatures overlaid as surface plots. So I have a surface plot here created of temperature overlaid on my critical components of interest. So we can see the, the temperatures here. And I have a handy little legend that I can move around and rescale um, easily if I want to just by adjusting those numbers there. So one of the things you'll notice right away is the second CPU is receiving a lot of the waste heat from the first CPU, which we might expect. So it's reaching a much higher temperature, and there's really not much we'd be able to do about that with air cooling uh, to improve that, right? Unless we could somehow put these two CPUs side by side, um, this one's always going to be a lot hotter. So that's one downside of this particular orientation. Okay, that's one area we can look at. Maybe we can improve later on. If we want to look deeper and I want to see the temperature of the actual chips, I can actually hide the heat sinks here, and I can do a surface plot on the top of the chips themselves. And then I can actually see the temperature distribution on those. And these models are a little bit simplified. I'll talk about the simplification that I performed uh, in a few minutes here. Um, but we don't have to do too much simplification to where you know we lose any detail. And in fact, the simplification itself is kind of optional. One of the great things about closed simulation is we can run studies with basically no simulation to your um, uh, files and the mesh will generate. It's just going to take longer to solve. Um, so I can take a look at any of these pieces of information here. And if I want to see, again, kind of the qualitative view of airflow, we love these flow trajectories here. These will show us basically um, a bunch of those little pipes like you might see in a lot of the, the screenshots of flow simulation or whatever type of output you want to be looking at. So again, great way to visually identify bottlenecks or where maybe fan placement could be improved. Okay. So again, in this particular server, a little overview of how it's set up. There's a bunch of hard drives in the front. There's an air opening in the front and inlet where air is being drawn in and blown over all these components. And the only outlets really are on the back here. Um, and you'll see they're, they're kind of blocked in. I'll talk about why I did that in a minute. The power supplies also have fans in them, and those are also drawing out air. Okay. Um, so this study I set up as what's called an internal analysis. That's one of the first things you need to consider when you're setting up a flow study. So there's actually a top on here as well, kind of a top component, top lid, and um, everything is all sealed off to create a, a closed internal space, and that allows us to run the simulation more quickly. So it's just a decision you make when you're setting up your analysis. I can actually show you that internal space here. Um, I can come down into flow simulation, click show fluid, and it will calculate and show us on the screen this closed off internal volume of air that we're calculating. So we're not calculating you know, any of the airflow around the outside of the server. We're treating it just as a uh, kind of like a cavity here, right, closed space. So we'll talk about some of the setup considerations for setting up that type of analysis. So if you want to run an internal analysis, you know, a lot of these electronic enclosures aren't completely watertight. Right? They're going to be sheet metal where they're bent up, and there might be areas where maybe they are going to be welded together, but you might not model those welds in SOLIDWORKS. So how can you get it to actually become airtight or watertight for the uh, internal analysis? So one method is a great option that was introduced a couple of years ago. It's called closed thin slots. And it's just an option in the mesh settings for flow simulation where you can enter in a threshold, basically a value, and any thin slots below that number will automatically get merged down so you can extract that fluid region, right? So this is an automatic way. I don't need to do any manual work whatsoever to close up a volume using that option. The most manual method would be just to extrude over those openings, right? You can sketch a little sketch 
shape like a rectangle and just extrude it over to merge that back down into a into a watertight body that's what I did on this model okay but there's many different approaches and then my my third option kind of one of my favorite ones if you you know if you really want to do an internal analysis because you know that you think that's the right type of study to do but you have all these openings everywhere on the thing say it's a more complicated shape and it's not going to be easy to close up you can always just run it as an external analysis. So I put external in quotes there. That's our idea of we're going to analyze kind of a larger area around the model, as you can see by this kind of rectangular shape. We're, we're setting our computational domain to a larger area around the model. Um, and we're still like having the fans and everything draw air through, uh, but we don't have to worry about closing it off. So any, any really internal analysis can always be done like within an external analysis if you want to. And that actually gives you some extra benefits. Um, which is that we can actually see how the air gets drawn in to the to the rack, right, and expelled out the back of the rack mount server. And we can also actually see places where we might have air leakage, like if I had some standoff holes here that didn't have the screws in them. Or you want to see the air leakage at those sheet metal seams where they're not going to be airtight. Uh, you can actually predict that by using an uh, external analysis. So a little bit interesting, and that's always an option because this requires very little setup. And um, you know, as long as you size the computational domain uh, fairly small, like we did here, you're really not getting a whole lot extra runtime, right? If you make it huge, yeah, it's gonna it's gonna take longer to run, but um, it's really not taking much longer. Okay. So talking about simplification, you know, any of the thermally insignificant components, little tiny hardware fasteners, bolts. Um, again, this is an optional step to suppress that stuff, but I would recommend it if you're going to be doing a lot of iterations of your study. Like I was here, I wanted to run this study a whole bunch of times. So I just went through, and you, there's tricks. You can like power select or select by volume, select all the little tiny resistors and capacitors if you have that all modeled on your board, and just suppress those. So select the bolts, and little tiny screws, and things like that, suppress those. It's an optional step, but again, I recommend it if, uh, you're gonna, especially if you're going to be running a, this analysis many times, right? If you're just running it one off, okay, we can get away with less simplification. It takes longer to solve. That's fine. Um, one thing I definitely do recommend, though, is what I did with those rectangles there. So uh, perforated patterns, like, again, are common on sheet metal parts, where you see these, like, here I had some hexagon holes on here originally cutting out. Um, we can represent those very effectively in the flow simulation by replacing them with what's called a perforated plate. So you basically just cut out that area, uh, put some kind of a lid over it, and and define it as a perforated plate. That allows us to set, you know, okay, it is a it is a hexagon hole pattern with the spacing, and it will give us a very similar overall um, flow resistance, right? We won't get to see the little micro level details of each, you know, airflow into each one of those holes, but typically we don't concern ourselves with that when we're looking at a, a bigger level system like this. Um, so again, one of the things you can do it if you really want to see, you know, the airflow through each hole. You could set it up that way, but you'd be shooting yourself in the foot for most analyses because it's going to take longer to solve. Um, there's also something called a porous medium, which is useful if you do have any filters. So say like a foam filter in front of here that we want to represent the flow resistance of that filter. It's a way we can model that in the system. So those are just a couple uh, notes on, on most notable simplification. I wanted to talk about some kind of productivity tips for when you're trying to set up these types of analyses in flow simulation. So I mentioned there's, you know, ele thermal electronics, there can be a lot of things to define, right? Heat sources, um, materials, thermal contact resistances. So one of the, my favorite new features for 2017 flow simulation, they added this ability to inherit a study setup from child components. So what this means is that I can go on the motherboard and I can define all the heat sources on the motherboard, the south bridge and the voltage regulator modules and all that stuff. And then anywhere I use that motherboard in, a, in whatever server or computer or whatever it is, I can just import that stuff in. So I'll actually show this in action in a second here. I want to show you this. You can even go multiple levels deep too. So you can store, um, um, store you know, study, relevant study setups on your child parts or assemblies. Another tip I use, and this is just a little known one, um, when you're applying something to one component instance, say you have a pattern here like these fans I had, and I define one fan, well then I can just go and pattern it to all the other fans by using this option, copy to component instance. That one's been in there a while, 
Uh, that setting's been in there quite a while, but um, it's a it's a good one, right? So I'm going to show those just really quickly. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go to a like starting configuration here where I don't have any of my studies set up, and I just want to show that I did have um, you know set up on the motherboard. So if I open the motherboard on its own, for instance. Um, I actually did this as a way to like test that I had everything set up correctly. So as I was working through and, and you know before I ran the server, I just took this motherboard and I ran some airflow over it and I ran the study and I saw some results, right? Everything looked good. I forget I had the heat sinks and everything on there, but I have all the heat sources defined and everything here. So we'll suppose we're going to reuse that in our assembly. Go back over to my assembly. So this is a blank new flow simulation study. And all I would do is go down to my tools. And I would say add from components. And basically this scans all the parts and assemblies that are in the assembly. And it shows me the ones that have flow studies down here presented. And I can pull from there and choose the study I want to bring in. So I can say, okay, bring in the properties from the motherboard and the two power supplies here. Redundant power supplies. And I click add. And all of a sudden it added that to my flow simulation tree. We can see it's in a category called from components. So I can collapse it. So it makes my tree really nice and neat and clean as well really helps with the organization, uh, but it's expanded down there. I can see all the heat sources, the material definitions, even the goals from there. If I had project goals set up, which oftentimes we use as like the virtual sensors, how we want to track data right at the key locations, those will also propagate up to the top level. This is a huge feature, so very happy to see that in there now. And the other thing I talked about was the fans. So um, whenever you're not actually designing the fan, you know, I'm not I'm not modeling the fan blades and everything here because I'm not the fan designer. I'm going to spec out these fans, let's say, and purchase them from a spec sheet. So in that situation, we use what's called a fan simplification in flow simulation. There is there is a utility we can actually you know run the fan blades in a rotating fashion and actually predict fan performance if you want to do that if you're a fan designer. Um, but we wouldn't want to do it on this top level system like this. We do that as an individual study. Okay, so here I. Just just want to represent the fan, so I'm just going to insert a fan definition, uh, choose the fan that I had created. We'll talk about that in a second here. And when you have a fan like this that's not on the out exterior boundary, uh, we define it using an internal fan definition. So I just choose where the, where the fluid exits and where the fluid enters the fan, and I'll click the check mark. So I placed one fan, but I don't want to manually do that you know, for the other five times. So what I can do is just right click on that fan, or it can be many different items, it can be materials, um, it can be a lot of different things, heat sources. And when you right click on it, you'll get an option copy to component instance here. So copy to component instance, we'll look at all the other instances of that fan in the assembly. And I'll just click the check mark there to pattern those around. So it's actually applied that same fan definition to my five other fans, right? Pretty neat. So I really like that option. So just a couple quick productivity tips uh, focusing on around the study setup. So we talked about how to set the internal analysis, or you can just run it as an external if you want. Um, a little bit of simplification and a little bit of how, how to speed up um, the study creation process using that, that option to inherit levels from subassemblies, or um, how to copy component instances. I do see some questions coming in here. We have uh, Damon on the line, should be able to, to type out uh, responses there as we work through. We'll also have some dedicated time for Q&A at the end. Uh, so if I'm not able to, if either of us aren't able to get to your questions as we go here, we can always talk them through at the end of the presentation here. So thank you for that. We can definitely make this a little interactive. Uh, and that's about what I wanted to cover on the Airflow one. Now, now before we go any farther, I want to actually quiz our audience here. <laughs> and see what you think. So make this a little bit interactive if we can. Um, you know, when I, I was doing some research on these rack mount servers as I got started on this project, and I noticed uh, not all of them, but many of them had this little plate right there highlighted in red next to the fan array. And I was asking myself, like, well, do I, do I really need that plate? You know, I mean, it, it um, seems like it would restrict airflow. Like, there's less you know, open surface area right there and I didn't know if maybe it was more for wire management or something or is it actually important to the uh, thermal performance of the server. So I actually want to kind of do my lifeline here. I'm going to ask the audience and uh, just poll quickly. 
do you think we need that plate there? And uh, I want to see your intuition on that. Okay, so quite a, quite a few coming in saying yes. So far we're at 71% yes, 30% I'm not sure. So that's good enough for me. We'll stop that down. So your intuition is correct. When I Now, this is one of those things that I, is just great about flow simulation. So maybe a more experienced designer would know this already, right? But some young new designer like me <laughs> is looking at this and, and saying, you know, do I really need that? Maybe I'll try getting rid of it, save a couple of dollars on the cost of goods, right? As soon as I started running the flow simulation, even just from the partial results, I could see this really bad recirculation happening there from these fans. Um, and it was just completely starving air from the power supply. So I was actually amazed by how badly the air was recirculating. So in this in this little picture here, I have a I do have a plate blocking it on the right side, but I didn't have anything on the left side. Um, so that would have been you know very bad for our overall thermal performance if we have that much recirculation there. Uh, and again, just really quick check that I was able to see almost instantly as soon as it started running the analysis. We get to preview the results as it's solving. Um, part of the reasoning behind that, just a little background, these fans aren't your everyday fans. They're they're really kind of fast. Like this this particular fan model, 20,000 RPM, and they can consume up to 15 watts, right? Which is a lot of power for a server. When you think of you have five or six of these in there, or four, whatever it is. So if we can reduce the number of fans, that's going to help out a lot. Um, also, how do I get these into the software? Well, there's a lot of fans built in, like especially with the electronics cooling module, there's a whole lot of fans built in. Um, out of the box, you have a, a few fans to start out with, and you can create your own fan definitions however you want. Um, so, the, you know, the spec sheets will usually have a, what we call a static pressure curve, curve of uh, pressure drop versus flow rate, and I can just translate that into flow simulation to create that fan definition. Okay. All right, so that's kind of wrapping the air the air cooled only section of our presentation. Now I want to talk about moving over to liquid cooling setup. So the first thing I want to do is look at what's called an open loop system where we actually would have the coolant pump and radiator external to the rack, uh, to the server. And then later on we'll look at how we could do a closed loop system, which would be actually if we had the pump and the radiator within the server. Okay. Um, so we'll look first at the open loop system. And basically before I, you know, I, I went into designing the whole system, once again I say let's look at the kind of a subsystem level. Let's look at first designing the water block for the uh, heat exchange to the CPU, right, using a liquid coolant. And this, this procedure is also applicable to if you're going to be designing a heat sink for um, uh, air-cooled system. It's a very, very similar workflow. I would still, you know, pick it at the part level, um, throw some flow over it, and, and see how it's performing. So I want to take a look at that here within the software and show you. I'm just going to close down uh, that, that motherboard I had open earlier here in a moment. And we'll take a look at uh, how we can design and optimize even just a uh, single component here. So I'm actually going to switch over to that uh, open loop configuration, starting configuration here. And I'll open up that, what I, I would call it a water block, but basically it's a heat exchanger, right? It's exchanging heat from the liquid to the CPU. So here it is. Now, I, I started off simple with just a straight, uh, straight fin design here. And there are some studies already set up that I can activate. But this one's uh, simple enough that I can actually walk through the whole setup process with you. So you can see, if you haven't seen a flow study set up before, just how easy it is. So uh, before we discuss those results that are finished, I'm going to create a new study from scratch. Okay. And basically, every time we create a study, I'll run it through this wizard here. So even the pros still use the wizard. <laughs> and we'll choose uh, our unit system we want to be using. We can customize those. Choose the analysis type, the internal versus external that we talked about. So this is definitely going to be internal. If it was an air-cooled heat sink, I might do external. Um, 
Okay, and I'm going to choose the physics I want to include, so heat conduction, and I'll say I'll include gravity too, even though it's probably a little bit negligible here. This is also where you could uh, control time dependency if you wanted it to be a transient analysis, for instance, or if you wanted to include the effects of radiation, you could do that as well. Now I'm prompted to choose my default fluid. On this study, it's going to be water. I'm going to include water there. On a you know heat sink, a, a air-cooled heat sink, it would be air. And choose my default material. I'm going to choose uh, 6061 aluminum. And just click through until I'm finished here. So now I've created a new study. Uh, it needs my definition set up. And I do have kind of a, there is a lid on this. It's kind of covering the top of it. But I like to just hide it so we can see the geometry underneath. Um, oh, great question about taking into account the added heat from the fan. Um, I don't remember if I added it or not in the study, but that would be important to include. Yeah, you would want to apply the heat power to each of those individual fans uh, to represent their contribution to the system, right? Great point. So as I'm looking here now, I want to define my boundary conditions. So um, I'm going to apply a flow rate in. So this is where we have to kind of take a systems level approach because we're just looking at the one component. I have to say, okay, well, um, you know, what's my flow rate from my external pump going to be? So I'm going to say it's a gallon per minute. So I'm just going to choose an inlet volume flow. And we need to choose the inside face of this little lid I have here. So I just right click and select other to choose that inside face and set my one gallon per minute. Okay. Then for the outlet, I'll set that as well. I'll set that as just a pressure opening. So I'll insert a boundary condition, set a pressure opening at the outlet here. Now you could do it other ways. You could specify a pressure drop across the, the uh, block here, and that would generate a particular flow rate. Right? Or if we're concerned about um, making sure we don't go past a certain pressure drop, I can set that as a goal to make sure that you know my, my cooling block here isn't too restrictive. Um, I also have, if there's any components I want to be defined as different materials, I think my default was um, aluminum, but say I want something to be made out of copper, something like that, I can just go into my materials and specify those components here. Right? So maybe the fittings are aluminum, everything else is copper, something like that. Now, uh, I could actually run the study at this point, but what I always recommend is to set up goals. And goals are kind of the virtual sensors that are going to track our solution. right? They're also going to be used for convergence, potentially, so they can basically tell the software, like, OK, you can stop solving once these goals have converged, which also helps to reduce our runtime. So I'm going to set up some goals here, and I'll do what we call a surface goal. And I want to, again, select the inlet and outlet. So a little trick I can use there is I can split my screen. I can click on, for instance, like the inlet volume flow. And that will select that same face from the inlet. And I'll track, let's say, pressure and the fluid temperature. So that'll be one set of goals. And then I'll repeat that same process for the other, the outlet. Just create a goal there and choose the outlet and choose the pressure and temperature averages here. Now, if you're a designer, you probably you're not interested in, in what the pressure or temperature is, but you're interested in the delta, right? The delta pressure, delta temperature. So I can track that very easily with what we call an equation goal. So if I want to be able to see those numbers live on the screen as it's solving, or automatically once it's done, it's worth your time to just put in the equation goal here. This allows me to do formulas for my goals. So basically what I can do is take, um, let's see, the inlet pressure is going to be higher. So I'll take the inlet pressure minus the outlet pressure. And you can rename all these to be more organized. And I'll call this my delta P. And I do the same thing for temperature. Right? I do an equation goal. The outlet temperature is going to be higher. So I'll choose the outlet temperature minus the inlet temperature. Call that my delta T. Right. Now I don't have to do any calculations while it's solving. I'll be able to see that type of stuff immediately. Um, we also did, I didn't set the temperature of the fluid, but if I look at that, that's another parameter we could adjust. Right? It's probably not going to be 20 degrees C. I could set it higher. Let's say it's 50 or something like that, or 40 or 30, whatever it is. And the last thing we could pay attention to, again, I could run it right now, but if I'm after the highest level of accuracy, I like to do this where I can just measure very quickly the distance between like if it's a heat sink, the fins there, I can see that's one millimeter. Well, I want to make sure that's resolved very accurately when I'm solving. So I can go into my mesh here. And this is, again, an optional step. But there's a little option we can set minimum gap size. I can just type in one millimeter. 
into my minimum gap size, and that will ensure that I have enough resolution to get good quality results here. Right? So that's it. That's all the setup. Just defining um, the flow rates, the materials, and the, oh, the one thing I forgot, the heat source. Right. So we're trying to represent the fact that this is going to be cooling off a chip. So I'll go in and put in a surface source. I can put in my wattage right here for how much uh, this needs to absorb. So I'm going to put in 125 watts, let's say, through that base right there. Okay. With that set up, I should be able to just come over here, click Run. It's going to automatically mesh and solve, and I'll be able to start getting those instant um, live results as it's solving, too. So I can identify, you know, hey, if I have a serious problem in the design or I mess up something in the setup, I can realize that before the whole simulation finishes. Um, this simulation only takes a few minutes, but that's especially valuable. You know, if you're running a huge assembly, it takes hours to solve. Um, it's great if you can catch early on, oops, I forgot to apply that heat source, right, or whatever it is. So you can see the goals I set up automatically uh, popping here. You can control what you want to display for the delta pressure, delta temperature, and I can see the results starting to come in on these velocity plots as well. And once we have this study set up, it's amazing because we can just go back to the model, modify the design however we want, rerun the study, and we'll get those new updated results. Right? It all lives on the SOLIDWORKS model, SOLIDWORKS part or assembly. So it makes it really straightforward if you want to iterate your design and um, kind of try to get either a better design or the optimal design out of it. Right? It's giving us all these things so we don't have to make as many guesses about the software, or about the um, uh, design. So I'm going to just jump to the finished version. I'm going to stop this. You can save partial results as well if you want to uh, interpret those. Okay. But again, this one takes just a um, few minutes to solve. I think maybe like three or four minutes. Uh, mostly because of that mesh setting I used. I think you could probably solve this in a minute if I hadn't uh, adjusted the mesh. Um, and then as a result, we're able to load up our finished versions where once again we can look at uh, you know, nicely resolved plots of velocity. You can look at the temperature drop, um, all those goals we specified, the pressure drop. Um, I, one thing that's kind of nice to show, we can show, again, the um, temperature at the contact interface. So we can see it looks like a big gradient here, uh, but actually the gradient is like a few degrees, right? So it's really nice. It's just our scale. And again, you can rescale these very easily if you want to. You know, if I want to adjust the scale at all, um, you know, you can't even see anything there. If I increase these numbers, it's not going to look like a gradient at all. Right? It's going to look like a solid color. Uh, but yeah, I really like how you can just easily rescale, reset these values. Again, just little things, but it makes it nice to um, interpret the results. And again, we could use the uh, more intuitive display the flow trajectories to see, you know, how this is performing. So you might try different things, right? I have another setup here where I um, put in some cross channels, add more turbulence maybe, right? Figure out if that's worth it for our, you know, the, the manufacturing trade-off might be a little more expensive. Uh, to create maybe or, or time consuming, but we can run that configuration and see what the results look like, right? And then start changing. Maybe I get to the stage where I want to modify each fin parameter. Um, then I wouldn't go about it manually. I would use what we call a parametric study. This is another tool within flow simulation. Parametric studies are basically similar to design studies, if you've ever used those before in, in SOLIDWORKS. The parametric study allows you to set up variables I have down here input variables. So I think I had uh, like a restrictor diameter on the on the inlet, and I had uh, the number of fins or something like that here set up. And I can specify goals that I want to track. If you want it to be an actual like convergence on an ideal goal, uh, we can do single or multi-variable optimization, or you can just use it to run a blind batch of studies. So you can just run a bunch of studies, you know, queue them up. So you can just click run on this optimization study, go about your other business. And you'll come back to, um, you know, a series of results where you can start to extract trends and figure out uh, what trade-offs are worth it and what's the optimal design. So some great functionality there with the uh, optimization. Okay, so that's about it for the uh, individual, you know, part level uh, analysis that I want to do here. So I want to switch back to the assembly and now look at this implemented because there are some assumptions. You know, we make going down to the part or subcomponent level that we don't necessarily have to make at the assembly. Now, one of the keys to making this all work, you might ask yourself, how are we going to do 
a mixture of air and liquid cooling? Right? That's a great question. Um, we do it with what's called a fluid subdomain. So because here I have two separate regions, right? I don't have the air and water interacting with each other. So I need to have that other region closed off. My fluid subdomain is closed off. And I can just come down here to this button for fluid subdomain. And basically, as soon as I choose anything within the fluid subdomain, as soon as I choose any um, selection within there, it's going to extract that closed off liquid region. And I can specify what fluid that is. So I can say, OK, it's going to be a liquid. It's going to be water. Or I could add other fluids. You could have multiple different fluid sub subdomains uh, if you wanted to. So pretty neat how we're able to um, just separate those regions using this fluid subdomain command. That's really the big trick for the liquid cooling here for the open loop system. Uh, so I'm going to flip to you know, the open loop setup that's already been defined. And uh, what I did here is I disabled a few of those fans too. So now we're going to have so much heat being removed externally. Again, we're assuming that's being pumped out uh, to some external radiator that we're not taking account of here. So I tried disabling a few fans. I basically have these dummy fans here. I only have three fans active. And then we can start to interpret the results. And the boundary conditions, we just have the same. We just defined here, like flow rates in and, in and a pressure out um, for the system. But again, it could be pressure drop across. So very similar setup to we had previously. Uh, and then we can load up and interpret these results. Okay, and it does get a little um, more interesting when you're post-processing, interpreting the results, because when we plot things, we'll have different options. Do we want to plot for the water? Do we want to plot for the air? Right, so we're able to control that here. Uh, so we can look at a, a, you know, a velocity plot, again, of the overall airflow, as we can see here with just those three fans activated now. Um, I can look at the, the external temperatures of all my components here, and again, I'll just rescale those to a more reasonable level, right? So my overall temperatures. And if I want to look at the temperatures in the fluid, I also have a surface plot here plotted on those surfaces of the fluid subdomain. So I can hide those components there and see. Now, they're on different scales right now. So this is where it becomes a little bit deceiving. The fluid subdomain is actually a lot cooler. Um, I had that you know, liquid going in at 20 degrees C. So um, the fluid sub subdomain is a lot cooler than, than this other one. If we wanted to rescale them the same way, we could do that, right? But it's just an interesting way we can see there's only a few degrees temperature rise um, you know, from one CPU to the other compared to the air-cooled method we had that showed the much more drastic um, temperature rise. And we can also look at the, uh, the trajectories of the flow in the air or in the liquid. And this is where you can start to see some things that we maybe wouldn't have seen at the part level where like it actually seems like we have quite a bit more turbulence in the second water block and that one actually might be maybe a little more efficient um, because of that right so you could go back and maybe say okay let's try adding in those cross channels again look at it from the system level right um, so just for reference these studies the uh on my system i have very outdated hardware <laughs> mind you uh, i have an old laptop that's got a quad core I7, 8 gigabytes of RAM, so nothing too special. Um, the individual blocks, I think, said took about like five minutes. The, the overall analysis for the air-cooled run of the server and also this open-loop cooled run took about 30 to 40 minutes. Um, so still very reasonable run time uh, for a full system level analysis. And that's, that's due in part to taking advantage of those different simplification methods I talked about. Okay. Um, so many more types of parameters we could look at here, but that's basically the gist of what I wanted to show. The key thing to know is how to operate the fluid subdomain when you're setting up a liquid cooling uh, system, right? And it's basically just setting up like an internal analysis within my internal analysis here is what I'm doing. Or it could be within an external as well. Right. So if we want to transition to what we call an open or a closed loop system rather, these are also fairly popular, not necessarily as efficient because you're now just kind of moving the heat around um, within the case. But the idea here is you would have a uh, radiator also inside the computer, right, or inside the electronics. So you're just using the water as a medium to transport the heat to a place that can be more easily 
expelled. Um, there's another technique that's commonly used in electronics to do this. It's called heat pipes, right, where they use kind of an evaporative cooling within a copper tube to transfer heat. We'll talk about heat pipes and how they can be analyzed in a few minutes. But basically, the electronics cooling module is the way to go for that. It has native support for heat pipes. Um, but again, I'm hearing more and more of our customers going to hybrid solutions like this, water cooling. And uh, I'm even reading about companies researching it, even for like mobile applications, not like laptops, which uh, you know, is something probably that would have seemed ridiculous a few years ago. Um, so to set this up, there's a couple of tricks we'll look at. But the first thing I want to look at is the, the design of the uh, radiator system here. So once again, we could do that at a, at a subassembly level. If we open up that on its own, this is a, a, an external analysis. Uh, this is an external analysis here that I set up with a computational, a very small computational domain. Maybe it could be a little bigger. So I set it up, and I have my fans, and I have my uh, radiator. And I have also a fluid subdomain on this one. So this is an example of using the fluid subdomain uh, within an external analysis, right, where it's defined right there. Um, and then we have our same type of boundary conditions. I flow through the radiator at those same rates that were specified. And I have the, the same fans here blowing air over the radiator. So as an output, we're tracking the same types of things, delta pressure, delta temperature. As an output, um, we can take a look at you know, the temperature across the radiator, either internal or external temperatures, or fluid temperatures. And I'll be able to visualize the you know, flow rates of the fans through uh, this radiator combination. Right? And again, we could iterate here if we want to. And again, we'll adjust the mesh refinement to make sure we're adequately capturing the, the little geometries of the radiator. Um, so this is an analysis that you can do at the part level and, and attempt to optimize a heat exchanger design. Okay. There's also some techniques I would recommend for simplification, depending on the scale of this heat exchanger. Um, there are some opportunities to simplify. So some of those, let's just jump ahead a little bit here. Some of those um, methods would be a 2D simplification or any of our 3D symmetry conditions. So if I go into my um, computational domain options in flow simulation, I'll show you here again in just a second. Um, computational domain options will have options for symmetry uh, as well as, if I look up at the top here, so any of these boundary conditions here, we can use symmetry or periodicity, it's called. We could also do a 2D simplification. So if you're OK with taking a 2D cross-section, that's the 2D simplification idea. But the other method, symmetry, would let you analyze half or quarter model. But periodicity is an interesting one. That one will let you actually take a slice. So if we look at, say, a radiator, um, take a slice wherever it's acceptable, like this yellow box area here, where all the other flow would be in parallel to it. right? I can take a slice and analyze um, periodicity condition of a, of a heat exchanger. Um, so that lets me you know, optimize little micro scale things like the fin geometry and things like that uh, more quickly than you know, trying to run it as a, as a full model, if you want to. Okay, so the other trick with implementing this closed loop system, I say trick, it's more of a tip. Um, we again use the fluid subdomain, right? But with a closed loop system, you basically have to pick somewhere for it to end, even though, yeah, it's a real, it's a full loop in, re in real life. Uh, we basically have to pick somewhere for it to end to get this to work for us. So what I did is I put in a component that's supposed to represent the pump, and the two lines just terminate into that component, okay? And then um, we'll jump inside the software to show you what I did with that component. And basically, there's two methodologies to do that. You can either just apply a flow rate right, to the, um, to the fluid subdomain. You can apply a flow rate at one of those points that I artificially said end. But then you end up in kind of this iterative process, because a pump in real life has its own pump curve, right, where it will behave differently at different pressure levels. So to create a closed loop system, I either need to like iterate, which no one likes to do just to get the solution to work the way you want, or I can use a trick, which is using a fan definition. Uh, so I used actually an internal fan uh, here to represent the pump. 
And basically the, the trick with that is the fans have static pressure curves, right, which we can look at here inside the engineering database where we set up all our materials. Uh, the fans have static pressure curves, so I can create basically like a pump curve, right, still pressure drop versus flow rate for the pump. And I'm using the fan definition to represent that. Okay. Uh, the one note here, if you're going to do this method, is the reference density is the density for reference of the fluid that you're working with. So by default, it's going to be set to the density of air. So in this case, because I'm doing uh, water cooling, I set it to the reference density of water. Okay. But then other than that, it's the same as a fan definition for setting my flow rates versus pressure drop. So neat little trick. That way we don't need to iterate and we'll actually be able to extract out at the end, you know, what is the pressure drop across the system and um, what was the actual flow rate that we achieved. So we'll be able to see those types of results when we look at this closed loop analysis here that I can load up. This one did take substantially longer to solve because we are <laughs> including quite a bit more effects. We need, uh, you know, all the refinement around the radiator and everything here. There's ways you could easily break it up, right? You could do kind of a hybrid of, of not quite a closed loop and still get good results um, for your analysis. Um, but one other trick to getting it to run faster, a mistake I made here is setting the initial temperature of the fluid. So when you set this fluid subdomain, you know, I might say I set it at 20 degrees C by accident. Think of it in real life, how much time that fluid's gonna take to get up to full temperature, right? Um, it's going to take a while, and that's going to be many iterations of solving to get it there. So if you can put in a guess of what the converged temperature is going to be, like I think I know these things usually run at 45 degrees C, um, you can set the initial temperature of the liquid to 45 degrees C, and that will solve a lot faster, right, because it won't have to solve for as long to, to wait for that temperature to, to level off. And this is all assuming we're doing a steady state analysis where we're after, like, the final converged results, right? You can also do a transient analysis where we want to look at dynamic effects, like if you're powering these chips on and off at different rates. Um, you can do that as well. But that's the only other tip I have for setting up the closed loop system, just the um, making sure the starting temperature you set is, is within the ballpark of, of what you're expecting uh, for convergence and using these internal fan definitions in place of a water pump. Kind of a nice little trick there. Okay. So with that, I wanted to actually go one more example, and then again, this might, might be an obvious one already. Another intuition thing, when I went to this configuration, I noticed uh, as I was solving, the power supply temperature was increased compared to the other configurations. And you just think, why is that? It's probably obvious to some of you, but um, you know, looking at it just visually on the screen, I was like, oh, what, what's going on there? As soon as I put up a velocity plot, or anything with streamlines, you could very easily see that those fans we added for that radiator were kind of starving the air away from the power supply. Because um, they still had only the three fans here uh, bringing air into the system. Now I added two fans on exhaust in the back. They were starving it away. So basically, correspondingly, the temperature of these components went down. Southbridge and everything like that decreased in temperature, but my power supply went up in temperature quite a bit. Right? Things that they always seem obvious after you see them on the velocity plot, <laughs> is what I like to say. Um, so maybe these are more obvious examples, but there's definitely design challenges out there that you would never suspect unless you had a velocity plot or some type of flow trajectory or something like that in front of you to, to look at. Um, so again, one of the reasons it makes this tool valuable. So now, kind of away from that case study I talked about, I just want to discuss some other capabilities of flow simulation, other possible applications. So related to the liquid systems, um, we can do pump design, right? So I talked about using the fan definition for when you're not designing the fan or the pump, for instance. If you do design the fans or pumps, then we can accommodate that with what we call rotating regions, as long as it's not a, like a reciprocating pump. Uh, but any impellers, anything like that, we can define a rotating region and basically where we actually spin the impeller and we look at what happens to the flow, and we can predict pump performance. You could even extract a pump curve from running, uh, say you combine the rotating region with a um, parametric study, right? You could test it at the different flow rates, pressure drops, and create a pump curve virtually. Um, but we can also use it for fan design too, right? If you have fan blades, propellers, anything like that, many different applications where uh, you could use these rotating regions. 
Uh, also related to liquid, we can do cavitation prediction. So if that's if your flow rates are high enough that you're concerned about cavitation in any areas, we can predict that. Uh, shows up in the plot here as a sudden change in density. Um, so we don't show bubble nucleation, anything like that, but still uh, prediction of cavitation, which is useful to help you make your design decisions. Okay. Um, and then other capabilities I want to talk about just related to electronics cooling. So this optional electronics cooling module I mentioned, this is an add-on for flow simulation that enables quite a few new capabilities um, useful for the electronics cooling industry. So everything I showed you was done um, with the, the standard flow simulation, but there's a lot of things I could have used that would have made the solution more accurate or easier to set up within the electronics cooling module. And that's kind of what I want to outline here. So one of the most major ones is, is native support for what's called a two resistor mod model. This comes as part of the electronics cooling module. And basically what that means is we can define our chip packages using a junction to case and junction to board resistance, which is what you might find on a spec sheet commonly, right? Um, so that gives us a more enhanced, accurate definition of the chip performance. We can you know, manually get around this, but it requires you, know, you doing some math and, and setting up uh, the model in a clever way to achieve the same functionality that's built in to the electronics cooling module. Um, another thing is the native support for heat pipes. So we can define heat pipes by their effective thermal resistance, which is, again, the parameter that you would find on a spec sheet. So if your devices use heat pipes, that's a, that's a strong reason to investigate the electronics cooling module to add on for flow simulation um, for those purposes. Uh, PCB layer definition. This is one I want to dive into a little more detail. So I said I did this without <coughs> the electronics cooling module. Um, I'll show you what we can do and can't do without the electronic schooling module. So for the PCBs that I had defined, if I open up uh, one of these, again, sub-assemblies here, um, you do get three PCB definitions built into the software. Basically, they're defined as orthotropic materials, non-isotropic materials, because PCBs inherently have those, those trace layer, copper layers in them that conduct heat better along that direction than they would in the, in the out of plane direction. So basically, without the electronics cooling package, we define a non-isotropic material. We define the uh, direction of the anisotropy there. And if we look in the material library, I basically just have two different thermal conductivity values, one for in-plane and one for out-of-plane. Now the question is, where do you come up with those thermal conductivity values, right? Um, if you already have a good idea, you have those values, then you can create your own orthotropic materials here. Uh, but if you don't for some reason, then the electronic cooling module enables kind of a PCB builder here that I can activate. So if I go through the electronic cooling module, I actually have a little section where I can actually put in layer thickness and the percentage of cover and have flow simulation calculate for me the basically thermal equivalency um, for the PCB definition. So it kind of takes out some of that guesswork by allowing you to build the, the, the PCB virtually um, inside the flow simulation uh, engineering database here to come up with a more accurate thermal representation. Right? Um, so that's all there. Also, another thing is if you, you know, I have to choose a, a coordinate system with a reference axis. So if you have these PCBs on weird angles or anything, the uh, electronics cooling package can help out there with that. Um, it also enables dual heating, which is the process of applying electrical current as an input to the flow simulation study and taking a look at the heat resulting from the electrical resistance, right? So you can use that in many different applications. Um, and bottom line, probably the biggest feature, in my opinion, is this expanded library. So many more solid materials, many more fans, um, thermal contact resistances built in. So it um, gives you kind of a better jumping off point for uh, where to get started with your study setup, right? If I look again at one of these studies here, I'll just show you like just for instance the fans, the difference between the fans that we have available in um, the standard package and the fans that are available in the electronics cooling module added on. So if I come down here to a fan definition,
um, under this predefined section here, so the default package would have these fan curves, and there's one brand, some example fans basically from Pabst that we can look at, right? So there's a handful of models built in. Now you can create your own definitions, it's great, but if you do have the electronic schooling module, you'll get access to all these different name brand fans here, right? From many different companies, um, many different model numbers built in. So again, just kind of a better jumping off point to have uh, all these standardized, uh, commonly used components built in. It's the same story for your materials and other areas of the software as well when you jump up to the electronic schooling module. Okay, well that's basically what I wanted to cover here, just to summarize. Um, in the very beginning here, we went over, you know, the air-cooled kind of setup process, looking at the, the simplification for the perforated plates, fan definition very briefly, and some of the productivity tips, like inheriting the subassembly levels, patterning component instances that make the setup a lot less monotonous. Then we looked at uh, how to optimize or, or set up studies on kind of subcomponents, like a heat sink, a, a water block, in this case a radiator, and how to implement those into your system using a uh, fluid subdomain to represent a, a cooling a water liquid cooling system within you know this air-cooled system that we have here. And we talked about some of the other capabilities. Uh, if you're designing pumps or fans, you can do that using a rotating region. Um, and basically the electronics cooling package to expand the baseline capabilities of flow simulation, adding those things like more materials, more fans, but also new capabilities like the native support for PCB builder, uh, heat pipes, and dual heating, the two resistor component model. Um, again, this was kind of an advanced topic that we wanted to run through, kind of this case study, look at these different methods of setting the studies up and different tricks. Uh, there's many more resources available down below here, additional webinars on our uh, website that you can reference. There'll be some, some other advanced topics and some more introductory level things too there if you're interested. Mm -hmm.